The Secrets of Star Trek is brought to you by the Star Quest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. You're listening to The Secrets of Star Trek, episode 128. Captain DeBridge. Spock here. Make it so. Surrender is not an option. Attention crew of the Enterprise, this is James Kirk. We are all explorers, driven to know what's over the horizon, what's beyond our own shores. We would have helped you get home if you had asked. That's who Starfleet is. Hi, I'm Dom Bettinelli, and you're listening to The Secrets of Star Trek, where we discuss the hidden layers and deeper meanings found in all the Star Trek TV series, movies, and more. And today we're discussing the latest Star Trek Discovery third season episode, Die Trying. Uh, we'll die trying to discuss this. No, we won't die. Joining me today on the <laughs> panel are Father Corey Stika. Hi, Father Corey. Yeah, I hope we don't die trying to do this one. <laughs> and Jimmy Aiken. Hi, Jimmy. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> so, folks, if you've not yet done so, please subscribe to the show in Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, tune in your favorite podcast app, or at the SQPN YouTube channel, where you should hit the bell to get notifications. I also want to make you aware of another show that you might enjoy on the StarQuest Network called American Catholic History. It's at sqpn.com slash history, and it's in about 15 to 20 minutes a week. You get a, another story from from Catholic History in America. And sometimes it's something you've heard about, and very often it's an unknown story that's very interesting. So check it out, sqpn.com slash history. All right, this latest episode, as I said, is called Die Trying. And it's very interesting, I, f I find anyway, that each episode so far this season has started with a different crew member's log, or most of the episodes have started with a different crew member mm -hmm. recording a ship's log or a personal log of some sort. Um, and this time it's Saru giving his log. Last time it was Dr. Culber. Before that it was, was it Tilly? I forget exactly who it was. But so we've had different people giving giving logs. Um, and they're, this is, they've finally gotten the coordinates to get to Starfleet slash Federation headquarters somewhere deep in space. And uh, they're they're on their way there. And obviously, I keep thinking they, they're, they have this, idealistic once we get there everything's gonna be so perfect and things are gonna be so good mm -hmm. and everything's gonna be all better and i'm as a viewer i'm sitting there going it's not gonna be what you think it's obviously not no. going well, to be as they're, good they're incredibly naive and they've apparently had some kind of advanced contact because saru says they're expected yes right at federation headquarters and they uh, they're just so naive. Assume it. Look, it's mm. a thousand years later. You're assuming they have the same values and the Federation hasn't turned Nazi or something. Right. <laughs> right. You should you yeah. should research these people before you show up and say reporting for duty. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, find out what you're getting into, because things could have and should have changed a bunch. Right. Well, right. And, and let's not forget too this whole idea of. At the end of season two, they basically wiped the memory banks of anything other than Discovery was destroyed in the battle. Right. And that was it. I mean, so they, the, the, the People future, in the future Starfleet yeah. doesn't know that Discovery actually still exists in their timeline until they reach out to them. So they're going to be suspicious, which, of course, plays out in the episode right. quite well, I might add. Yes. So when they get to Starfleet headquarters, Federation headquarters, it's this the area with this big cloaking field around it, which is kind of cool. It's a little bit of an yeah. interesting effect. Uh, and then they, when they go through the cloaking field, inside are all of these new ships and new technology that they they geek out over, just like all of us yep. technology. Yeah, all of us watching geek, geek <laughs> well, <laughs> over it. <laughs> all of the ship geeks geeked out over yeah, it. I, we, yep. I admit, I'm a ship geek, and so I, I geeked out. There is Same a here. USS Voyager J that's there, mm -hmm. which they recognize. Do, do they recognize or are they just like, oh, look, that ship is called Voyager J? Because they wouldn't know the Voyager. Well, they, they, just counted, they just counted the, uh, Tilly was just counting the the letters that okay. this yeah. is the 10th or 11th iteration of this Voyager ship. Okay, okay. Uh, but they wouldn't, they wouldn't know who, who the USS Voyager was or that why, you know, we yeah. saw. Why know, they yeah. would preserve the name um, like that. And there's yeah, also... The, uh, 
a, a little Easter egg in there that you'd have to you'd be very closely watching to see. There's a USS Nog, the Eisenberg yep. class ship. Eisenberg class USS Nog. Uh, so that was a nice touch. And it, it sounded like you nice know, his tribute. family was very, very appreciative of, of that. So yes. that, that. That was cool. That was cool. Um, I like that the, the, there's a new USS Constitution that's 1,000, no, 2,000 people. So it's like twice the size of a, of a galaxy class. Of course, <laughs> Tilly wouldn't know what a galaxy class is, but right. all the fans are going, ah, okay. Yeah. They're saying this is bigger than the, e, the D Enterprise. That's right. Yeah, I mean, the, the, in, by comparison, Discovery has like, it's, I think its normal complement was 160, and they have like 80 people on it right now or something along those yep. lines. So yep. massive ship comparatively. Uh, so they they get there. They 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 are they they're the first little bit of concern is is when they're told no. Well, oh, we're taking over as, control. In, in oh okay, so right yeah, yeah, they guide them in by remote control, and then they have um, Burnham and Saru and Ad- Adira yes transport yeah. over, and I like how the transporter effect is now just flash and they're there yes it's mm-hmm. the transporter cycle is much shorter than we've seen it before right right yeah it's uh, the, so we get this glimpse of the technology there's lots of nanotech uh smart material stuff um i did you notice on that display that central display they have as mm-hmm. they beamed over there was a, a reference to the kazon in that yes did you see that, that yeah there's also fun. a reference to the founder's original home world and several other references to distant places yes uh, so they evidently we know where the founders are now <laughs> so no their yeah. original home world oh the original oh, okay okay uh so and then the this admiral shows up uh oded Ferrer plays the admiral i really mm-hmm. i've enjoyed him in a lot of different things uh, he's a really good actor um and he plays this really really well he's he's not he's not a villain so much but he he's you could tell he is not a friend to these guys, and he's he is an admiral who's beset with problems. And here's right. a new one laid at his doorstep that I have to deal with. He's suspicious of what's going on here. Where did this ship come from? How did it get here? You know, is this really? You know, of course, there's a whole plot line of the 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 temporal war. Yes, uh, are these yeah. actually temporal agents from the past coming forward? Which they they specifically mention. Well, right. and um, he points out technically your appearance here is a crime, <laughs> right? Because right. we're not supposed to have time travel anymore, and you just kind of time traveled, right? Right. And then uh, the, the, he you know lays out all their problems. The Orion and Andorians are in some kind of a, a hostile alliance. We have these sick mm-hmm. refugees, and this is when Burnham's like, "We can help. We'll we'll, we'll uh, find a cure for the refugees." And he's kind of amused at this offer of help from this. It's like if if a ship came, showed up in the in twenty twenty from the fifteen twenty. <laughs> And, what, yeah. and they're like, we can solve your problems. Like, sure, that's that's great. Yeah, Thank we'll, you. We'll, we'll sail over. We'll sail over to Japan and talk to them <laughs> about trade. Right, right. Yeah, yeah that's going to work well. So the refugees are called the Keeley, and they are basically gray aliens. I mean, they look like- their their body form is gray alien, although their coloration is a little different. Um, they have a problem that they have a misfolded protein infection yes. that's apparently being caused by a, by a prion, which they mispronounce as prion. Right. Um, and Burnham says in order to fix this, uh, you need to go to the place where they were infected and get a clean, properly folded copy of the protein so that you can um so that you can figure out the antidote and i'm kind of guess a little bit going along with this but not yeah. a whole lot <laughs> um why don't you but um that's why they the uh discovery could be of help because they've got the spore drive that can take right. them anywhere instantly right. whereas none of the current federation technology does that and these guys are going to die in like 4 hours exactly yes you four got the hours. ticking clock of course <laughs> yes yeah uh so uh, we get a little information we find out that the, there are 38 member worlds left in the federation that they're aware of down from over 350 mm-hmm. at the peak uh the admiral tells them that we have no records of as we said, anything about control, the angel suit, the spore drive, in any Federation database because it's all been wiped out. Um, uh, he tells them, "I cannot risk trusting you with anything without evidence of who you are." Even at the same time as he acknowledges that they are owed a debt that can never be repaid. You know, he's like, "What you've mm-hmm. done, as you say, 
is is you know you've saved all life in the universe. On the other hand, I can't, I can't afford to trust you until I have evidence that you are who you say you are, and that's that's smart. And, He's being very smart there. That, no, no, that's 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 completely plausible with within you know the situation that the Federation finds itself right now, mm -hmm. and you know, and this is again, it's you know, this could all be a trick. This could all be just a complete you know Trojan trick horse. to get into their trust, and then right. yeah, Trojan horse and. So it, it's it really it shows him to be a very intelligent uh, officer that he, he's he's going to say, I'm not going to I'm not going to trust you until you prove that you're worthy of trust. Uh, now, of course, that sets up the OK, now we have to do this episode to prove that we're worthy of trust. Right, right. It's the, clearly the 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 setup for the episode. Um, and then they're told and, that and oh, okay. and to complicate things more, he yeah. like sends over holographic interrogators to interrogate the discovery crew and find out, you know, their backstories and observe their operations. And there's the threat of, we're going to break up this crew and reassign you to other places, mm -hmm. you know, after presumably some kind of 31st century orientation. Right. Yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, so the crew is like, wait, but we're military officers and we thought we'd be, with each other together in so much togetherness because we're yeah. together now in the future. We thought we'd be together forever, even though we're military officers and should expect to be reassigned to where we're needed. Well, exactly. I'll give them a, I'll give them a little slack. I mean, they've all gone from the, the, the 22nd century or whatever to the 31st century together. You know, it makes sense to that. If you're going to split them up, you're, you're going to lose whatever, they're, they're going to be fish out of water. Keep them together. And they're the yeah. only ones who know how the spore yeah. drive work. I suppose you could train other people, but. So, you, you, yeah, you could have your holographic dudes go in and figure it out in a day. <laughs> Perhaps. Um, <laughs> the, they the, do point out they what, only need Stamets <laughs> at this point. Yeah. yeah. The the thing that I just find annoying, though, is it, it, sets, up the, it sets up more togetherness language. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Which has just become a, it's become a hackneyed meme on this show at this right. point. You never heard uh, well, Kirk talking about togetherness with the crew. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> but you did see a lot in Voyager though. That was kind of where this, a lot of this started. Yeah. Let, let, let's be honest too, though, that that's always been the, the idea of, you know, the ship, the crew will never be broken up has always been a trope in Star Trek that, you know, anybody who's ever served in the military or government or even corporations kind of goes, yeah, that's not how the real world works. Yeah. <laughs> it goes back at least to TNG in that sense where yeah. they were all there for seven seasons, you know, again, because you don't want to get rid of your actors, I suppose. I mean, that's well, the, the problem and, of portraying it. And I, I can I can tell you, you know, like in, in the real military, you know, Riker as a, you know, second in command. Yeah. Uh, gets offered you know, command three times and refuses it three times, he's not going to get a fourth time. He's yeah. going to get told, okay, bye. And that actually came <laughs> up. They did an episode on that, you know, where they yep. where they said that. Yeah, so it, it did come up. I mean, other other shows that feature military things, they do, they end up doing the same sorts of things like the SEAL well, team and that Babylon, sort of stuff. Babylon 5 did it much better. Nobody mm -hmm. by the end of that show is in their original position. Absolutely right, right. nobody. Right. Yep. Right. Well, yeah, they well, they lost the captain. Um, what's his name? Uh, the original Michael O'Brien. Michael. O yeah. 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 But um, I see what you're saying. But but the show was set up to handle that kind of thing. There were there were what J. Michael Straczynski referred to as trap doors for every character. If he lost mm -hmm. the actor, here's what he'd do instead mm -hmm. to keep the story moving. And it, one of them even got the double reverse trapdoor where Lita Alexander was on the show, then left mm -hmm. and came back. Yep. Um, and Talia Winters was her back door. But you look at everybody in the military, you know, the military mm -hmm. crew mm -hmm. of that station. The doctor is not the same. The uh, the the security chief is not the same. The second in command is not the same. The captain is not the same. Yep. And it's not because it's not simply because the actors left the show that happened in a few cases, mm -hmm. but they also moved in their roles in the career. I mean, Captain yeah. Sheridan ends up becoming the president of the, of the broader Alliance. Yeah. Uh, Ivanova gets promoted to, you know, work on this other ship. They bring in captain Lockley. Garibaldi goes into the private sector. Yep. He gets replaced by his security underling. Um, the doctor hands off the torch to a new doctor. And there's this shot in, um, 
not the series finale, but it's close to it, where you have the uh, kind of a passing of the torch scene as one spaceship is leaving Babylon 5, and they look into command and control and see all of the new people and all of the ambassadors, aides who are now taking mm-hmm. over as ambassador and so forth. And it's it's a transition of generations, but it happened piecemeal over the series. Star Trek could do that, and it has never done it. You mm-hmm. know, one of the, one of the things that it seems apparent with with the discovery, especially, but in Star Trek in general, over the years, they have moved more and more away from this is a military ship. This is a we're part of a military. Like it's like they're uncomfortable with Star Trek is is a sci- scientific and military force. And that definitely started with Roddenberry. I mean, right. And try not so explicitly at the beginning, but very much in TNG, he was moving yeah. that direction. And then when like Brandon Braga and all those took over right. TNG from him, they moved it much further. Right. DS9 kind of moved it back a bit because of the war. But Enterprise was clearly, you know, we're we're not a military. And Discovery has just taken that to the nth degree where, you know, they they wear uniforms and they have ranks, but it's they act like they're, you know, a corporate ship in space you know that's more like yeah. a civilian vessel than anything so uh it yeah and and the yeah the tech the the, the togetherness talk is kind of gets a little overwhelming i mean i know we're all in this together in the future because we all went together and that sort of thing mm-hmm. but it, it's a little it can get a little much i agree with that a little irritating yeah <laughs> so at this point burnham decides to do it to be Burnham and break the rules to prove that discovery and its crew should stay together. But to his credit, Saru wants to prove to no. Starfleet that they're still Starfleet and we will obey orders and, and be good soldiers. I really like the way that Saru dresses down Burnham privately and says, mm-hmm. I thought yeah. you would have learned this lesson. You're talking about getting your hands on this stuff. It's like, right. we're not going to make our first mission breaking orders here. Right. Right. We'll we'll do what we need to do by going through proper channels. Yes. I also like that uh Burnham starts talking back to the Admiral before that and he basically says stand down. <laughs> yeah. You know. Yeah. You you know, you ain't in charge here. You don't belong here. Knock it off. Yeah. You know. <laughs> yeah, but it also seems like a reversion uh in Michael's personality. Yes. To she's back to bucking the system, and it's like, wait, wasn't that the point of season one? <laughs> right. Of right. of we don't do this, and you've grown by the end of season one, and it's like someone hit the reset button and rebooted her personality. And and I think the idea is that that one year alone with you know Booker and and also then by herself, sort of mm-hmm. she kind of lost the sense of I'm part of Starfleet. Uh, that mm-hmm. I, that idea, and she she learned to do what it takes to get by. I I, I mm-hmm. can see that. But yeah, like I, I was waiting for Saru to go, uh, battle of the binary stars. <laughs> you know, the, yeah. <laughs> that, that would be work. twisting the knife. Yeah. Yeah. That didn't work out yeah. too well. Let's not do that again. And to be, to be fair, I, I think that, that, that could be fitting with the character of that yeah. old habits die hard. Yes. I, I, I'm, I'm okay with, with that, uh, that playing out here, uh, it, because it plays out. I think the way it, it resolves is good. I think, they they yep. they do play it out well. Uh, I I did I I like the crew debriefings by the hollow AIs, especially <laughs> Giorgio, which uh, is yes. becoming my favorite. She managed to uh, just yeah. sh- shut down the hollows by by rapid blinking at them because she knew there was some way mm-hmm. that it would interrupt them. Uh, it was it was great. Yeah, and it's, it's, it's she says you blink at their harmonic frequency and it disrupts them. And there's no way a human could blink at that rate. Yeah, right. Yeah. But but. It's so fun that I'll give it to yep. him anyway. And she then, once she she circumvents their holographic interrogators, she's got this guy who's there wearing gl- glasses just because he likes them, he says. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And she's got to deal with him. And he's clearly a a some kind of covert intelligence person. Right. Maybe from the future Section 31. Uh, yeah. And yeah. and he he when we have this mind game conversation between him and Giorgio and he quickly deduces that Giorgio cares about someone on the ship. So he right. deduces the existence of Michael and he also tells her that there have been no contact, no crossovers with the Terran universe in 500 years because our universes have been drifting farther apart. Right. But he still knows about her and he knows about Terrans and he is 
clearly setting her up for something. And after the who do you care about on the ship, she doesn't tell him who it is, but right. he deduces that there must be someone on the ship she cares about because she wouldn't otherwise have come. And then that's the last we see until of her in, until the very end of the episode where Burnham runs into her in a corridor and she's just standing there cataleptic. Yeah. And doesn't even initially respond when uh, when Burnham says, hi, how are you doing? And then mm -hmm. all, when she does snap out of it, she doesn't realize that anything is wrong or that she's been behaving strangely. So apparently Mr. Eyeglasses did something to her that messed with her yep. that we'll yep. have to find out about in the future. Well, and, and she, you see it as this is going through because she's getting rattled. There's a couple of times where you, you can just kind of see on her face that she's kind of like, wait, what? Uh, when she finds out that, that the universes are split apart and people aren't crossing. She kind of kind of leans back a little bit and kind of looks like, Oh, and then again, when mentioning, Oh, there's someone on the crew and that she kind of looks rattled that he figured this out. By the way, mm -hmm. he's played by David Cronenberg, who is mm -hmm. director of movies like the fly. He's like this big time horror movie director who also acts. Yeah. yeah. He's like the equivalent of uh, uh, Werner Herzog in the Mandalorian first season. Yeah. So they get the, the director uh, and, uh, that's why he has the glasses. He's sort of that's his iconic look, and so they have to have him wearing the yep. glasses mm. in the thing. Well, it, he and knows, also, um, I'm sorry. Uh, he's good. I was just gonna say Go he seems to know an awful lot about the mirror universe, like yes. a, more than mm. you'd expect. And so I think well, that's gonna play into things. And he yeah. tries to make it sound like, well, I was born on April 5th, which is uh, you know first contact day, but it's also the day that the Terrans conquered the Vulcans, right? Or, and that's yeah. how he plays it off. Always been fascinated by the the uh, the the Terrans because I was born on their holy day. And, and she even says, "Yeah, th this is a Terran holy day, the day the Terrans beat the Vulcans." Um, I like non. She just does the the military. I'm in it, you know, being interrogated yeah. by the enemy. Name rake serial number. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> and uh, yeah. Uh, by the way, before we leave uh, the glasses and Giorgio scene, I like the sophistication of the interrogation they have because glasses says that um, he knows that she's not incentivized to answer his questions. So the only things he'll learn about are her come from the questions that she asks. Yes. Which is a fairly sophisticated approach. Yep. And then her first question is, who's really in charge now? <laughs> because, and and, yes. and uh and she also links that to the burn and he indicates and we have another indication of this as well in the episode that even though they had suspicions about who may have caused the burn it never they could never resolve who it was that it was a single bad guy right right yeah he's just conflicting theories but no one knows but i wonder if he's lying like it, maybe yeah, of he, course knows. he is yeah yeah so uh, so, th so that's, that's about all we get of the Georgia. In fact, I don't think Giorgio is on discovery for the rest of this episode, except until the very end. No, except until, until the very, very end. end. Yeah. So the discovery, they've, they've, they've got this prion disease thing. Prion? Prion or prion? Prion? Prion. Prion. Sorry. I want to say it right. So mm -hmm. <laughs> they, and they, <laughs> they realize in order to get this original untainted copy of this plant that infected them, they have to get it from a seed vault ship that's still around a thousand years later that they, they remember, which is si similar to the doomsday seed vault that's in Norway that actually exists yeah. here. Mm -hmm. I was, I was going to say, I really liked that they brought in this concept because we have this in case of a nuclear war. There yeah. is, it's called the Svalbard global seed vault. It's on the Island of Spitsbergen in Norway and it stores seeds for all of the major plant species that you would need to reboot civilization. Right. Um, and so we have this doomsday seed vault and it makes sense that they would have it for the Federation. It makes sense. They'd put it on, a, on, I mean, they'd really, frankly, they'd have more than one. Yes. But, right. um, what is not plausible is that it's on this tiny little ship yes. that mm -hmm. is microscopic cons compared to Discovery. If you're storing the essential seeds from all over the Federation, this thing ought to be huge. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Uh, well, frankly, and it should have more than one family on it. It should be. I mean, why? Why isn't it on a, a, a an obscure remote planet, like just buried somewhere in some stable remote planet that's on a, a star that's unremarkable, etc.? 
Well, I, you, you, ideally, what you'd want is a bunch that are on planets, but yeah. you'd also want right. some that are mobile so that yeah. if their locations are disclosed, they can't just be taken out. When you get the resources of the Federation, you should not put all your seeds in one basket <laughs> like they <Yeah>. have. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, so Vance wants to put a new crew, the Admiral Vance wants to put a new crew on Discovery to go check it out. Burnham acts insubordinate, and Saru asks mm-hmm. nicely and agrees to remain behind as a hostage, I mean guarantor, while the security team goes with Discovery uh, as a guarantor of their behavior. Um, and the ship is called, the, the seed ship is called the Tikov, which is a Russian name. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, they explain that the responsibility for the, the, the maintenance and control of the ship shifts among member worlds of the Federation. And so now it's uh, in control of Bar- the Barzan, which is Nons people. And uh, so when they get there, of course, there's an ion storm because there's always an ion storm floating around <laughs> inconveniently in in Star Trek space. Uh, and uh, we again see Detmer suffering her PTSD. I wanted to mention uh, Vance tells Michael, get back fast. Otherwise, it comes down on him, meaning Saru. Yes. Mm-hmm. Which is a kind of. A little dark. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. It's a little dark for, you know, this is a sign the Federation may have changed. I mean, he just, he just, that's a hostage situation. Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. Okay. (laughs) Um, And, and then Michael is like, let's show them who we are. And it's like, oh man, do we really have to do this again? (laughs) This is another, another one of the memes. We've got the togetherness and let's show them who we are. And it, it's just it's 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 hackneyed, repetitive writing. Right. Um, mm-hmm. So, yeah, thank you. The 23rd century is going to teach the 31st how to be good officers. Right. But it does give us a nice moment where because Saru has stayed behind, Michael is now in command of the ship and she gets to say black alert for the first time. She yep. does. She does. Yeah. But she takes command uh, and she does a, a good job in command. I mean, I got to say she she doesn't do any mm-hmm. of the, the, the silly things. She's, she's very the, the things go. They don't go according to plan, but she manages to take control of the situation as we go. I love the I love the uh, uh, security officer that went with the security lieutenant. Yeah. Where she's like, oh, I oh, hopefully this bucket of bolts will hold together type of deal. Yeah. And then it, then as soon as they get out of the, the spore jump, she's just like stunned. <laughs> yes. Like, whoa. Yeah. What was that? <laughs> the, 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 the 23rd century can still teach the 31st century something about spore drive technology. So the yeah. uh, it's amazing that no one ever discovered it in the in re- intervening thousand years. Or Centuries. Yeah. Uh, it's yeah. getting interesting. So. Well, the only two ships that had it ended badly. So <laughs> right, right. Yeah. Uh, so non Culber and Burnham uh, beam over to the uh, the the seed ship. Um, there's radiation on board, of course, and there's uh, the plants have gone crazy growing. They would they shouldn't be all growing, mm-hmm. but they are. And somebody's in a cloak on board. So that's we we get clearly. Uh, they find a hologram of the family that's supposed to be on the ship running things. Um, and the mother in the in the hologram is hu- humming the same lullaby that Adira was playing on the cello in the previous episode, which Burnham notes. Yeah, and Burnham notes it and later asks about it. It's like like it's something really suspicious mm-hmm. that the 31st century would have a would have popular music that people know. <laughs> and, right. and and she's she's like grilling at the end of the episode. She's grilling this person at, at Federation headquarters. And the person is like, I don't know where that tune came from. It's just something everybody knows. I know a version of it. And it's like mm-hmm. Burnham is like, but it this must be important. Why do all these people know Yankee Doodle? <laughs> Uh, yeah. like, come well, on. In the past 930 years, people, the stuff has spread. People know things. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, and of course, they're trying to make it sound like, well, because, you know, all the planets are so much further apart now because of warp drive issues and all yeah. this and the other things. There's no way this this music that could be hundreds of years old from before the burn spread well, to all these different planets. So yeah. obviously, in a, in a bit of a ham handed way, they have they're foreshadowing that this is means something. I, and put that in quotation marks and capital letters. It mean something mm-hmm. which we will probably find out soon uh yeah. so uh, I, I do that. like that 
Yeah. I do like that since the, the seed ship is under Barzan control, that Nan gets to ditch her breathing apparatus and Burnham and yep. Culber have to wear them. Yes. And she also gets to, the actress gets to take the uh, contacts out because it's <laughs> the was, home atmosphere. I thought that was kind of a neat, neat effect, too, that, you know, that an oxygen atmosphere, which is toxic to Barzan's, causes the, the color change to her eyes. Yeah. And then switches, you know, and I thought that was kind of a neat, mm -hmm. neat effect and explanation. Was it, what did she say? Real air, real me. Yes. And she says real air, because for her, that's the yep. real air. So I, that, that was, yeah. that was a nice bit. Uh, so we find out that they, the family was uh, struck by a disease and killed all of them. And no, they're in not by a disease, by a, it was, it, it was. Oh, this, the this radiation. So crazy. Yeah. Yeah. It's radiation. And so we're told that their bodies, which are in cryo, even though they're dead. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, we're told that their bodies have high concentrations of beta particles. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> beta particles are electrons and positrons. So you're telling me they are ionized? <laughs> <laughs> That's yeah. they have a high concentration well, of electron storm. Yeah, well, an ion storm. Yeah. I'm kidding. We're told it was a proton storm, right? So they were bombarded with protons, and that led to them having extra electrons in their bodies, and that killed them. I uh, think you should read a few more books on how this works. <laughs> is, is, is Andre Bormanis not available to be science consultant anymore? <laughs> like, I thought we yeah. had a good science consultant in Star Trek. <laughs> so, uh, we had Wavium is uh, at, at work here. Anyway, oh, uh, yes. the, it, uh, the, the family's dead, but, but the dad didn't die. He's the one who put them in stasis. And he's this is why all the plants have been growing is he's been growing plants to find something that to have a quote unquote cure uh, for it. He attacks Burnham has to beam into the, you only beam into the vault. And so he attacks Burnham mm -hmm. in the vault. He's phasing in and out. There's something wrong with him. And so, uh, and we'll mm -hmm. find out that what happened is the only reason he survived is he was in the middle of beaming into the vault when this, whatever radiation struck and it, he, it saved him, but it also meant he's not fully phased into our reality or something like that. It's a transporter thing again. Uh, hey, mm. Let's wave our hand at it. <laughs> and, is, is this is this kind of like uh, uh, on Lord X, where he got uh, just before the final sequence, yeah. so he's making the noise and glowing? Is it kind of like that? It would have been awesome if they'd put the noise in. That would have been great. Yeah. <laughs> so so uh, I I did like this bit where Nan says he's not insane with grief. So, like she kind of pushes back on Culber and Burnham because this is her culture, her faith, her religion. Yeah. He says, Barzans don't have the same ideas of grief and death uh, that that you do. And so he's l l operating out yeah. of his own understanding. Right. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. So now tell us what those are, please, so we, the viewers, <laughs> yeah. can understand them. Yeah, that's true. That's true. They didn't they didn't explain it. Um, and of course, they burn him in. Culbert decide, well, it doesn't matter. So we're just going to override it anyway. Um, and she wants to use Burnham from the Vulcan perspective, wants to use logic to reason with him. Uh, instead of his uh, faith, grief uh, elements there. Um, well, and once again, so previous episode, Culber had pushed Burnham to like mediate on behalf of of Adira Tall. Yes. With aliens. Now, Culber again pushes Michael right. to mediate with an alien. Right. To make her simply to make Michael more central to the plot, because right. Nan is the one who should be talking to this guy, right, and, and playing on their cultural under mutual cultural understanding. In fact, she is talking to him, and then they kind of push her out because she's not yeah, being right. harsh enough with him with the reality or whatever, uh, which yeah, is yeah. a little little disturbing. Well, and, I, and you know, I, I, I sat there and thought, well, Hugh would be the perfect person to talk about death since he's you know been there. Unless you have a common frame of reference with it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so you have to say that I have to die. Uh, so, um, yeah. <laughs> and, oh, and that's what it was. It was a coronal mass ejection from yeah. what? Mm -hmm. <laughs> a nearby star, by the way? Is a there... star. Yeah. I and mean, that's where coronal mass ejection, uh, ejections come from. Yeah. yeah so, yep. And uh, so they, they do cure the dad, but then they have to convince him to oh, give them the password, it, yeah. which they it, left it, yeah. Starfleet headquarters without getting first. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Also, this is another inspiring speech resolution where 
Burnham gets has to give an inspiring speech to resolve the main plot conflict. Yes. So it's like, haven't seen that before. That's so innovative. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. She's so convincing to, you know, to get him to change. Uh, then after they've got the seed, uh, the, the, the vial of seeds or whatever, the dad refuses to leave the ship for radiation poisoning. He wants to stay and die. Hugh wants to take him against his will. He, he, he's, what he says is he, want, he won't leave his family. Right. And so why would you leave a dead family on a seed ship anyway? Mm-hmm. Why not just take them with you and he can come too and not die? Well, this seems to be the obvious thing. I mean, they yeah. don't set it up as he's got a death pact now. Well, and then, yeah, like why, yeah, why not take them to the discover to discovery? Nan says the Barzan will be sending a replacement crew family, and she's going to stay behind permanently. Like, well, the, like that. Yes. Well, she eventually is going to get says she's going to go back and see her home world, right? So she's going to fill. She's going to finish up the Barzan's watch, and then whoever comes next will replace her. And she's now the the woman out of time, back on her home world, yeah. and no longer in Starfleet. I guess. I guess it's kind of a and. And and is running a mission, a civilization mission critical ship for from the 31st century that she has no training in how to operate by herself. By herself. Well, with this guy well, until he dies. But yeah, yeah. I mean, Ugh. at least at least the ship itself is from the 23rd century, but I'm sure it's had plenty of upgrades in the process. Yeah. Over the 900 years. Oh, I, I assume I assume it's a different ship. No, um, they they say it is the same ship. It's the hmm. Tikov. from the twenty third century. That's what that. Well, it's the, I I assumed it was a it was named the Tikov, but that it was just the thirty first century's version of the ship. You would hope, but <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, what I was disappointed though, I like Nan as a character. I don't want to see her go. Right. Exactly. This seems like a stupid reason to write her out of the well, show. Yet yet another character where we get to know more, much more about the character in the episode where we lose the character. Right. Like, yeah. uh, what was her name? The android character who was fascinating. Yeah. Adirum. Yeah. Well, and this is yet another security chief. This is the third security chief we've lost on this ship. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what I really hate, though, about it is the is the final moment that Nan has with Michael because mm-hmm. she tearfully, I mean, she's like misting up, tearfully praises Michael. And is talking about how great Michael is. Michael, 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 Mike. Marsha, 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 (laughs) Marsha. I mean, this is, this is, this is just, this is why Michael comes across as a Mary Sue. Yeah. One of the characteristics of Mary Sue's is they have to be praised. This is a flaw in a lot of contemporary writing where Mm -hmm. in order to build up a character for the audience, you, you have other characters praising them and talking about how great they are and how cool they are and how meaningful they are. And this is, you see this in bad comic book writing. You see Mm -hmm. this in bad television and movie writing. This is just bad writing. Some have tried to link it to um, a generational shift um, with millennials feeling a need for constant praise mm-hmm. the way schools have been set up now. And, and then they, and therefore that translates into writing with younger writers. Um, what it reveals is a fundamental lack of self-esteem. If you have to right. constantly be praised by other people mm-hmm. and it comes across what it, so even though it's meant to make us admire a character more, when we see a character praising them, it actually undermines it. Because it feels like this is being driven by emotional neediness, or you because people don't talk like this in reality. Yeah. Mm. Um, and you would not have seen this speech with any other lead character in a Star mm. Trek series. You would not have seen somebody, uh, one of one of Kirk's fellow officers misting up and telling him, you know, how great he is <laughs> and how he's just the bestest person ever. You right. wouldn't have seen that with Picard. Oh, you no. wouldn't have seen that with <laughs> Cisco. You wouldn't have seen that with Archer. You wouldn't have seen that with anybody until mm-hmm. now. How about right. Janeway? Janeway, no. Yeah. I don't, I don't think, <laughs> no. I mean, you could you could have people who are in emotional relationships that can say, you know, I love you or I really care about you or things like that. That's different than, oh, you're just the bestest, most specialist person ever. And uh, you're so meaningful and we're all together and we're going to show them who we are. 
Right. You know, Gene Way had someone who left the ship and came back crazy. <laughs> yes. So I mean, <laughs> that's true. That's true. Something different there. Well, you know, and I could have, I could have seen it if they had made this speech about, you know, this would have been the place for the togetherness speech, right? You know, about the whole that. crew discovery, <laughs> and that would have been more reasonable to say, I'm going to miss the crew, including you and Saru and all these other people. I've only been with you for a short time. But, you know, we I felt so together in our togetherness that we've been together in this togetherness, you know, you know? Yeah. and that would have been much more reasonable than just, oh, look at how wonderful Michael Burnham is. She's like the most perfect, wonderful officer. I wonder if this is comes down to the very structure of the show, which is they've decided from the beginning that our viewpoint character is not going to be the captain of the ship. It's going to be a, a, an under mm-hmm. officer at one point, a traitor like, to the Federation, all that sort of yep. stuff. and. But by, by by its very nature, the captain is the, the the central point, the axis upon which the ship turns. He's what what mm-hmm. keeps it together. It's all that sort of stuff. But because she's not the captain, Saru is. We have to keep building her up in the dialogue in order to remind the audience how central and important she is. I don't think so. Um, you can have stories that are focused on someone who's not the ultimate person in charge. Yeah. Right. Um, you know, in in uh the Kane mutiny. Right. That's set on the that's set on the senior officers, but Captain Queeg is not the the main character. Well, that's because he's the mm-hmm. villain. Um he's the villain. Uh in But where Saru's um, not the villain, you, know, in, in, you have to kind of compensate. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, we're, but in this case where Saru isn't the villain, that the, the, No, but you you yeah. can have other situations. I was about to name a couple. One of them is, um, you know, you have you have stories like, and this isn't exactly it, but like upstairs, downstairs, that could be focused on the butler as the main <laughs> character, even though he's a servant of the upstairs people. We just um, had a Star Trek series that was based on Lord. not the captain. It's <laughs> called Lower Decks. Right. Right. Yeah. It was a very, very good series yeah. based on not the captain. Right. Also, um, you have uh, Stargate, you know, whoever the team leader is, whether it's Jack O'Neill or the guy who replaced him, he's not in charge. General Hammond is. Yep. And so you can you can have people a series set about people who are not the ultimate commander who are under somebody and it can still work as a great series without having to. Oh, Jack, you're the bestest person ever. Let's jump in that wormhole again. I guess so. I, I, I guess it's the. Um, I, that I guess, sounds weirder than it is. <laughs> yeah. I guess it's more of it's. It's not so much that it's inevitable, but I think they set themselves up for it. Like they they feel this need to continually build up Burnham, uh, yeah. in the mm-hmm. face of uh, some unspoken criticism of some sort by by a viewer or a fan. Like remember, Burnham is great. Burnham is awesome. Remember, Bur- and maybe still responding to the criticism of the first season. Yeah, that's not how you I, I, I think that could be part of it. Um, it could be a response to fan criticism. If to the extent that it is, that's not how you win over skeptical fans. Yeah, no, you you don't win me over if I'm skeptical of Burnham's qualities by telling me she's good. <laughs> you, right. You, you win me over by showing me she's good. That's right. Um, well, so the, it, that's a counterproductive strategy to the extent that's what it is. I think it's also just, though. There's a generation of writers in Hollywood that don't understand writing and they have this touchy feely and they don't understand science fiction and they have this touchy feely approach that Mm -hmm. uh, that that tells rather than shows us character virtues. And it results in Mary Sue's like Harry Potter and Ray from Star Wars and Michael Burnham on Star Trek. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, the funny part is just a couple of episodes back, we complimented on how they had changed Michael Burnham's character, how we even talked about at the beginning of this episode, how, you know, like her character went through a major shift and we liked where that character was going. Yeah. And then they throw this in. Right. Well, Mm because they showed us the shift as opposed to just simply informing us. Well, they also told us about it too much, but but they showed it to us. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So uh, let's move from uh, the the bad things they did with Burnham to the bad things that they do with Saru next, <laughs> which is this. This is to me the the low point of this episode, and I'll I'll explain why. Back at Starfleet mm-hmm. headquarters, Saru gives some nonsense about the time before the Renaissance being the Dark Ages, but oh, Jodo yeah, saved oh, humanity yes. by developing the three point perspective in art. 
it, it's like way to to promulgate the old Protestant anti-Catholic canard that anything that happened before the Protestant Reformation was the Dark Ages. Uh, Thomas Aquinas, mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, yeah. Great, yeah. Great Thomas art. Aquinas Augustine. would like to have a discussion. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I mean, just oh, like in in this whole like, nonsense that the three dimensional perspective in art by Jodo uh, gave us change society, change society to see yeah. depth and perspective. I'm like, and in, in, in give us perspective on other things outside of ourselves. It's just, oh my gosh, this is the worst sort of pseudo historical analysis. I can't, I, it's and, so bad. And the monks, the monks who did scientific study and philosophic research and theolo- theological st- uh, oh. speculation and so on, yeah. they did nothing until... Yeah. You know, science until science. And if I was there, I would want to say, yeah, that that depth perception thing really changed society. People never noticed that they hadn't had two eyes and binocular vision before. <laughs> but, oh, once they did, after Giotto showed them, guess what they did with it? They used it for better range finding with their cannons and it brought on a whole new destructive yeah. aspect to war. <laughs> well, right. it's, I mean, it, it's. It's just like there was there was no color in the world until color TV was invented. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, everything was in color. <laughs> yeah, it's just, oh, it's the worst kind of historical revisionism. But the whole point the, is supposed the, to be the, that. The silliest yeah. point to me, though, is the now let us inspire you the same way. To look up at, at the stars. At, yeah. Oh, man. <laughs> if, I'm, if I'm Admiral Vance, it's like. Wow, are you full of yourself? <laughs> well, exactly. Oh, you're, but he uh, ate it you're up. from the dark ages from my perspective. Yeah. And now you want to inspire us. Yeah. You just barely earned a place in Starfleet at all. Much less now yeah. you wanna now you wanna inspire everybody. You have an enormous ego that needs to be deflated pronto. <laughs> well, I mean, one thing that could like you could have made the argument in better writing, which is that we come from a different time from before when things fell apart. And so we can help right. bring back some memory of what the principles and vision of the Federation was like yep. before Uh-oh. all of this. I suppo- so you're going to, you're going to teach us our principles. Thank you very much. But even that would be better than this like silliness about the dark ages before the Renaissance and three point perspective. I mean, I don't know. Like what was the writer? It was a Sean Cochran who wrote this. What was he thinking? Like who let them get away with that? That is just terrible. That's a terrible analogy. I just, I mm. couldn't believe my ears on hearing that. And of course, I, Vance I, is like, Oh yes. What a great idea. I, I thought that, well, he, I think it was a little cooler than that <laughs> towards the idea than that, but yeah. I, I, I can kind of excuse the historical ignorance thing, you know, because the writers are just historically ignorant and Saru mm-hmm. can be historic. He's not even a human. Right. You know, right. So so they can and, and they've had a burn. And so there can be a lot of historical ignorance. I can excuse that. It, the thing that I find the worst is the arrogant assumption that you are going to be this healing balm. Right. To our society, when you just showed up and don't understand hardly anything about right. how society has changed and what problems it's facing, and you're going to fix them right? as the big inspirational bright light. I'm sorry, if someone showed up from 930 years ago and after fetching some seeds, <laughs> then... <laughs> propose that they play this revolutionary role it's oh, like i'm sorry you are clearly naive and arrogant as heck and you need to get better grounded in the realities of the here and now before you even think about playing some societal inspirational role this is oh, this is just yeah. incre- i mean this this proposal is delusional yes Oh, but but Burnham lived in the you know in the future for a year, so she knows everything about it. <laughs> yeah. You know, actually, I just had a great idea for a, a new TV series called based on the Vikings, where the Vikings encounter like a wormhole and end up in 2020 and inspire mm-hmm. us with their Viking <laughs> principles yeah. from 930 <laughs> years ago. <laughs> Restore our perspective. Uh, oh man. Okay, so uh, not, now, none of us were a fan of that from, aspect. From from the show's viewpoint, yeah, it makes sense that it's like okay, we want we've ship moved the show nine hundred thirty years later. We want the ship to have a positive impact on its surroundings. All mm-hmm. of that makes sense. Show it to us. Don't 
tell it to us. Right. Yeah. When you when you say explicitly to the admiral of Starfleet in charge of Starfleet, this is what we want to do. Yep. And, and he either has to say yes or no. If he says what he should say, which is no. Yeah. The series is in trouble. So he can't give a no. And if he says yes, he looks like an absolute idiot. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's just bad writing again, but yep. based yeah. on the tell don't show principle. Now, again, we all love Star Trek, but this is one of the oh, flaws yeah. in Star that Star Trek has picked up over the decades. And yes. this is goes back to TNG. This standing on a bridge or the equivalent and giving these inspirational speeches. Picard did it. Cisco did it a little bit. Uh, yeah. Janeway certainly did it. And Archer did mm -hmm. it. And it's it's a yeah. flaw in the way Star Trek sees itself as this. We are providing inspiration to the viewer instead of just tell a good story. And other shows yeah. do it, too. And plenty of shows and movies do it, too. And it's Jack O'Neill didn't have to give inspirational speeches. He <laughs> hated doing that. He wisecrack instead. <laughs> it was it was a lot of fun. I'd rather see <laughs> see Jack O'Neill do doing that than than this sort of stuff. But I I kind of wish they'd kind of get a, too many TV shows. They want to preach at the audience with this speech at the mm -hmm. end. Oh, don't get me started on oh some of the stuff I've been watching in twenty twenty you know brand new twenty twenty stuff apart from Discovery. It just oh stop preaching at me and just well, show and me what you want to say. Show me again. You know. Speaking of shows that are, you know, concurrent to this is why everybody's enjoying The Mandalorian. Listen to the Secrets of Star Wars if you want to find out more. Yes. Um, it no just tells a great story. <laughs> yes. There's, there's no preaching or at least no outward preaching uh, on it. So it just yeah. tells a good story and it's been doing a really good job of telling a good story. And, and yep. Discovery could really use to get back to the idea of, of actually telling good stories and not worrying about what speech are we going to have this time. Right. Yeah. All right, so I liked, um, I liked on Community where they made the Jack Winger closing speech as a trope. Yeah, that mm -hmm. they treated mockingly. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's like, okay, okay, give us that patented Jack Winger speech now. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, tell us yeah. the lessons we've learned this time. <laughs> All right. Anything left to say about this episode, uh, Jeff well, Winger? <laughs> I've got a, a couple of things. You know, I, you know, of course, at the beginning of the episode. It, Burnham wants to know about her mother, and of course they don't know anything. I I really wonder if they're even going to play that out. I wonder if they're even going to bring that character back. Mm. I'm kind of making a prediction Maybe that to kill her. Yeah, yeah, there you go. Yeah. She'll, she'll show up just long enough to die. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm making a prediction that the spear data is going to have the what caused the burn. There's going to be something in the spear data that's going to lead mm. them to figure out what the burn was okay, and it may not be. This may be kind of a, a sleight of hand, saying, "Oh, somebody did it." It may not actually be someone. There may be something else. And it might be related to the whole splitting of the two Terran universe and, and prime universe. I think that's a clue. You know, the, I don't the 500 year split thingy. Yeah. I think you that's know, that, that, that's that's that that might have caused the burn somehow, um, whether it is the Terrans did it somehow or something. Mm -hmm. But anyway, so just kind of a couple little predictions there. Somebody um, did it. Yeah. I, I I got a kick out of the the, the medical hologram where scanning Burnham says, "Are you prone to em emotional exaggeration?" <laughs> and of course, everybody goes, "Yes, <laughs> <laughs> yes, she is all the time." And then when I saw the seed vault, my first thought was, uh, when I was doing computer doing IT, there used to have those hard drive storage carousels where they were like you know big cabinets, six seven foot tall cabinets where there are carousels of hard drives, and that's how they would do backup is the thing would spin out, pull out a hard drive, plug it in, do the yep. backup, put it back, and spin to the next one. Right. And that's kind of what I thought it looked like was the seed version of that. Also like the, in uh, the Rogue One, the Unscara, yep. the, uh, yeah, the, store, the yep. backup drive storage. Yes. Very good. Jimmy, last thoughts? Um, I noticed there's this Lieutenant Nilsson who is a blonde human woman that yeah. shows up in this episode and... They seem to be promoting her to bridge crew status or something, even though she hasn't been before. She's um, and but she's apparently I looked her up and she apparently has been on the show before, but I mm -hmm. hadn't really noticed her. Well, but she, it seems like they're building her up now. She she's been on the bridge and actually she's the original Arium. And mm -hmm. then I think there was something like the prosthetics affected her skin or something, but they uh, wanted her on the show. They so then after the, the second uh, second Arium died she was brought on as her replacement okay oh, okay yeah, yeah she attended a funeral and then replaced her as the new sport yeah. drive ops officer on the bridge okay okay yeah 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 yeah. 
that's interesting. So they wanted to keep the actress, and now they're, they're kind of giving her more to do. Uh, all right, so let's wrap things up there. We want to take a moment to thank our patrons who make it possible for us to create the secrets of Star Trek, including Mitchell R., Pat S., Al R., not Al Roker, Julia S., <laughs> and Sean M. Their generous donations at sqpn.com slash give make it possible for us to continue the secrets of Star Trek and all the shows at StarQuest. You can join them by visiting sqpn.com slash give. So that's it from us. Well, what did you think of Die Trying? You can let us know by commenting on the show at sqpn.com slash trek or our Facebook page at facebook.com slash StarQuest Media or send an email to trek at sqpn.com. We'll be back next time when we'll be discussing this, the next Discovery episode called Scavengers. Until then, Father Cory Stika, thank you for joining me and sharing the secrets of Star Trek. Thank you, Dom. Jimmy Aiken, thank you as well. Thanks, Tom, and live long and prosper. And once again, I'm Dom Bettinelli. Thank you for listening to the secrets of Star Trek on StarQuest. And remember, Commander Burnham fell out of the sky with Captain Pike. It was raining Starfleet officers. Bring any snacks, I'm starving. <laughs>